Uh, hello, I'm Michael Horowitz, Inspector General for the U.S. Department of Justice and Acting Chair of the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee. I'm pleased to welcome you today to our forum, which we're calling Stakeholder Perspectives on Oversight of the Federal COVID-19 Spending and Response Efforts. Joining me today are the 19 other inspector, inspectors general who are members of the PRAC, along with today's invited panelists. The PRAC was created by Congress a few months ago in the CARES Act to help ensure that the more than $2.4 trillion in emergency funding for pandemic-related relief and recovery efforts are being used for their intended purpose and are not wasted or abused. As a committee and as individual inspectors general, we seek to improve the overall effectiveness of government programs. And um, we uh, do that through conducting our audits, reviews, investigations, and making recommendations following that work. We also advance accountability and transparency by ensuring that the public is informed about how this money is being used. As Justice Brandeis famously stated, sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants. Through these oversight and accountability efforts, we hope to play a positive role in ensuring proper use of these pandemic related funds while promoting the greatest possible insight into the operation of these government programs. It's in that spirit that we're holding today's forum. In our first two months, the PRAC has developed and launched a website, pandemic.oversight.gov. I encourage everybody to go there and look at the website. That website will allow the public to track the money spent by the federal government to combat the pandemic. The website also provides a one-stop shop for all COVID-related oversight conducted by the PRAC, the Inspector General Community, and the Government Accountability Office, or GAO. It also will include the video from today's hearing, as well as the prepared remarks of our witnesses. In addition, in the past six weeks, we've hired Bob Westbrooks as our executive director and Linda Miller as our deputy executive director. And they will lead the day-to-day -day coordination and oversight efforts of the PRAC. As we move forward and refine our strategic oversight plan, we believed it would be extremely helpful to hear from a diverse group of stakeholders on the front lines, including those representing groups most impacted by the government's response to the virus in the public health and economic spheres. Today's forum presents such an opportunity. We look to our 12 witnesses that you'll hear from today to provide insights on specific areas where the PRAC should focus its oversight attention to enhance transparency and accountability over the government's pandemic response efforts. We've invited speakers representing state and local government, small and large businesses, financial institutions, not-for-profits, the healthcare sector, and government transparency organizations. Thank you in advance to our witnesses for your willingness to share your views with the community. We've divided today's forum into four panels. First, we'll hear state and local government perspectives. Next, you'll hear business, financial, and nonprofit perspectives. Third, we'll hear the healthcare perspectives. And our final panel will focus on government spending, oversight, and transparency. For each panel, an Inspector General member of the PRAC will moderate and introduce our speakers. So let me begin, and we will start our first panel, and I will hand over the microphone to Sandra Bruce, who is the Acting Inspector General at the Department of Education. Sandra, let me turn it over to you and invite our first panelists to um, unmute. Miguel, Melinda Miguel, Kenny Pointer, and Robert Asaro Angelo. Thank you, Sandra. All Thank you, Michael. It's my pleasure to introduce our first panel providing state and local government perspectives on the pandemic and the federal government's response. Our first speaker today is the Chief Inspector General for the state of Florida, Melinda Miguel. Ms. Miguel has served as Florida's Chief Inspector General since January 2019, 
and previously served in the same position from 2011 to 2017. Ms. Miguel has over 28 years of public service to include serving as a federal inspector general. We look forward to hearing from Ms. Miguel. Ms. Miguel, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Please unmute your mic. Thank you so much, Sandra. Really appreciate that kind introduction. I'd also like to thank Michael Horowitz, Bob Westbrooks, Linda Miller, and the Pandemic Response and Accountability Committee for your invitation to provide a state government perspective regarding the federal COVID-19 spending and response. It's an honor and privilege to be here with everyone today and to partner in our oversight and to enhance transparency and accountability over emergency pandemic funds. Thank you for your leadership on setting up this listening forum and we appreciate the host so much for arranging this important opportunity. It's an honor to represent the Inspector General community from the state of Florida. And that leads me to clarify that my remarks today are not that of a chief financial officer or a budget officer, but as an Inspector General. Florida's Inspector General structure was created in law in 1994 and mirrors the federal government structure in certain aspects. One is that the state of Florida has an inspector general in every single state agency. We also have an inspector general within a few of our local governments as well, Miami-Dade County, Broward County, Palm Beach County, and the city of Jacksonville, plus within several clerks of court at the county level as well. We enjoy a robust inspector general community and an informal network across the state with similar and complementary missions that include auditing, investigations, with a lens towards economy and efficiency and detecting and deterring fraud, waste and abuse in government. In Florida, we also have a chief inspector general created in state law. And this office houses the state's whistleblower hotline, serves as the inspector general for the governor's office and appoints and removes agency inspectors general in those 18 governor's agencies among many other duties. We differ in certain aspects from our federal counterparts in that the state government level, we are part of our agency's budget and most do not have full law enforcement powers. While like the federal system, we are housed in our agencies to add value to the agency's mission. Certain fast facts about Florida, we have 67 counties, 74 school districts, seven water management districts, 12 public universities, 412 incorporated municipalities, and many, many special districts. Our population is around 21 and a half million. We're the third largest state in the nation and number four in terms of state economies. At the state level, uh, state government employs about 113,000 employees with a $93 billion budget before the impact of COVID-19. An estimated 37.6% of the state's budget passes through to the local government levels. In Florida, there's an estimated additional funding, approximately 16 billion from all three supplements across more than 70 programs. The coronavirus relief fund means 8.328 billion in relief funding for our state. Of this amount, 2.472 billion goes to 13 eligible counties that met the population requirements of the law of greater than 500,000 in population. And these eligible uh, counties make up about 67% of Florida's total population. The remaining 5.856 billion is allocated to the state level. And while this is good news, we understand the tremendous responsibility to properly spend quickly to the right areas needing relief but with appropriate transparency and accountability. From a fiscal perspective, there is limited comprehensive government data right now about the full extent of the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on state, local government and tribal governments. There is a need for that impact analysis and that study with continual update to allow for a data-driven and risk-based response and recovery here in the state of Florida. Preliminary information is not promising with lots of opinions on how long COVID-19's effects will last and how long recovery will take. 
Further, state, local, and tribal governments have experienced for some time and will continue to experience a dramatic loss in revenue and other negative financial impacts and impacts on Florida's families. During times of crisis, such as Florida's hurricanes, and now this pandemic, government experiences an increase in demand for many of our services, causing a corresponding increase and in rise in expenditures. I've heard from other government officials around the nation talking about staff layoffs, furloughs, and budget reductions. I've heard of some having to consider potential reductions of critical programs and services. Many states, including Florida, have experienced problems with the unemployment compensation due to unprecedented volume of the suddenly unemployed. Currently, Florida has a 12.9% unemployment rate and lost over a million jobs in March and April alone. The demand for this public assistance was tremendous and the system failed to function as needed. Governor DeSantis requested that, the, that I investigate what went wrong during this time of crisis and also to look back to the original project to see if the system was properly designed with the necessary capacity. Most people recognize that state and local governments are dedicated to the public good, working to serve people and solve community problems in ways that improve lives, strengthen communities and the economy and lighten the burden of tax payers, government and society as a whole but few realize the enormous breadth and operational complexities of doing so. When states are responsible for local government's proper spending, but the cost of oversight and the funding to review indirect cost monitoring is limited, there are challenges to transparency of spending practices during the grant cycle and risk of clawbacks on the back end of the process. Some thoughts for improving future recovery efforts include providing standard guidance at the front end of a grant cycle, providing clear and comprehensive guidance to address the existing funding and be clear which, which guidance applies to which funding streams. Also to publish that guidance in a transparent manner. Any waivers should be documented in writing so that auditors can see the documentation to support the differences and ensure that the guidance does not change midstream or add extra components after the grant agreements are signed. It's extremely important to allow the maximum flexibility so that state and local governments can decide how to spend the funding and document their rationale for doing so. Also to streamline and simplify application and reporting forms and procedures. I think it would also be critically helpful if the the PRAC committee were to provide clear examples of performance metrics that are known to have a clean audit opinion, to give examples to state and local governments so to actually help us pass audit reviews. What Florida is doing in response to the Corona Relief Fund includes setting up a central command structure across government. Also, the state is leveraging its existing uh, disaster expertise through its network across the entire system within Florida. This CARES coordinating office is using a risk-based data-driven approach. And this CARES office is developing documentation requirements and using a centralized database to collect documentation regarding eligibility, applications, reporting, performance metrics, and monitoring. And we are leveraging state agency expertise and the inspector general community on the front end of this process to provide oversight to existing funding streams. We're also adding working groups to assist with oversight on matters such as fraud prevention, and complaint handling, internal controls and risk assessments, data reporting, performance metrics, and federal guidance. Finally, we are collaborating across all levels of government and government associations are a key to this mix, such as NGA, NCSL, NASAC, AGA, NACIO, and others, including the Association of Inspectors General, as well as SIGI and this committee. As you know, Congress created this committee to mitigate, mitigate major risks that cut across program and agency boundaries and to prevent and detect 
fraud, waste, and abuse and mismanagement. Congress provided funding to the federal inspectors general, and while a great step in the right direction, they did not earmark funding for state and local inspectors general and auditors. It's important to note that state governments had not yet restored many of their administrative and oversight funding levels since pre-2008. And so therefore many state inspectors general and state auditors and local inspectors general and local auditors continue to do more with even less and less. Finally, and most importantly, we know that the people of this great nation are counting on us to exercise appropriate transparency and oversight over these funds to help so many, such as the American workers and families, small businesses, communities, the healthcare sector, and state and local governments to survive and recover from the coronavirus pandemic. As I close, I offer the following website, www.floridaoig.org, as a reference place that is a repository where we're trying to gather and place all the federal guidance related to the three federal supplements flowing to the state of Florida so that we have a one-stop shop sort of location or library for this federal guidance to help the cities and counties and state uh, agencies in the state of Florida to find or locate um, those guidance materials readily. Um, please allow me to offer any further service to this committee and my colleagues across government. I especially wanna thank those that care so much about the future of our nation to participate on this call today. In times like these, we need everyone. We need all of your ideas and all of your information to help create a more resilient and safer future. We need to learn and listen like never before. In closing, I wanna thank Michael Horowitz, Bob Westbrooks, Linda Miller, Sandra Bruce, and Allison Lerner, and so many others for what you do every day. And thank you so much for inviting me to provide a perspective today from the state government inspector general lens. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Inspector General Miguel. Please mute your mic. Our next speaker is Mr. Kenny Pointer. Mr. Pointer is the Executive Director for the National Association of State Auditors, Comptrollers, and Treasurers, NASAC. Mr. Pointer has also been a partner of a local public accounting firm in Lexington, Kentucky, and a principal auditor with the Kentucky Auditor of Public Accountants. Mr. Pointer, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to your comments. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sandra, for that kind introduction. And I also would like to thank you for the invitation to be here and speak today. Uh, the National Association of State Controllers, uh, Auditors, Controllers, and Treasurers, or NASAC, would like to thank the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee, or PRAC, for the opportunity to provide our views at today's listening forum. You know, NASAC worked closely with the Recovery and Accountability and Transparency Board uh, during the 2008 financial crisis, and we look forward to a very similar productive partnership with the PRAC throughout the life cycle of the various COVID-19 relief uh, funds provided by Congress. While we recognize the importance of getting these funds out quickly to address the health emergency, we also believe very strongly that providing the highest level of accountability over these vast amount of funds, of public funds, is of great importance. In the past, NASAC has worked closely with the federal government and the governors of our states to ensure the proper use of relief funds while at the same time meeting the desire for expediency to address a crisis. And we stand ready to do so again uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. Just a bit about NASAC. We, we represent the state's top financial officials, the state auditor, the state controller, and the state treasurer. Of course, the state auditors conduct the independent audits of states' financial statements and also conduct the single audits of federal assistance. State controllers prepare the state's financial statements. They establish internal controls, in many cases on a statewide basis, and in some cases serve as the centralized grant management agency within the states. And of course, the state treasurers uh, serve as the state's banker uh, issuing payments on the state's debts. 
So as such, you can see that NASDAQ's members cover the full spectrum of government financial accountability. We have about 183 organizations that are members of our association, and those 183 organizations have about 21,000 professional staff. And interestingly enough, 70 of our members are elected by the citizens of their states on a statewide basis. The need for communication and collaboration between federal, state, and local governments has never been greater than it is today. If our experience with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or ERA, taught us anything, it was that frequent and consistent communication was the key to success. State and local governments are partners in this effort, and we hope the PRAC and the federal grantor agencies and the federal inspectors general will view NASAC and its members as such and take advantage of our collective experience and expertise as that our association members uh, provide. We know our state governments well, and including those agencies and programs that have historically presented the highest levels of risk. The boots on the ground are at the state and local level. We firmly believe that. And using our experience and expertise can minimize the misuse of public funds, and we encourage the PRAC to call on us to, to assist in this area. We know that it's still very early in the process, but we believe the following items are of immediate concern and should be addressed as quickly as possible. Number one, a comprehensive listing of federal funds provided to the states should be prepared and distributed. That listing should be further broken down by the total dollars received by each state by catalog of federal domestic assistance number. We need to know how much each state received by CFDA number. That would be very helpful as we try to provide the highest level of accountability over these public funds. Now, just to demonstrate how fluid this situation is, uh, my next point has actually been addressed with Treasury's frequently asked questions that was issued last Thursday. So you can tell we're in a very fluid situation, but as I submitted my statement, another key point that we wanted to bring out was that relative to the coronavirus relief funds or the CRF, we needed to know whether these funds are going to be subject to the single audit. And if not, how will compliance requirements be independently tested? We also wanted to know what are the state's responsibilities over those funds that are passed to subrecipients, for example, local governments. Uh, if that local government misspends or misuses the public funds uh, that's provided through the, the recipient, the state, Will the state be responsible? So those were two key questions that we had. To Treasury's credit, they did issue an FAQ last week, as I mentioned, and they answered both of these uh, questions. These funds will be subject to the single audit, and we think at NASAC that is the right answer. And they also answered that states will be responsible for misspending by subrecipients. Uh, in most cases, that will be local governments. So we appreciate Treasury's response to these questions. Uh, we also still are looking for guidance on how the CRF funds will be reported to the public facing website and to the PRAC, which of course is you know, required in the law. So we're still looking for some guidance on that and uh, we anxiously await that uh, from Treasury. You know, the PRAC, uh, we understand, it, it faces many challenges to provide accountability and transparency over COVID-19 relief funds. However, uh, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or ERA, provided a very good roadmap on how all levels of government can collaborate successfully in a crisis. And we believe critical to this success will be the federal agencies providing consistent guidance, not only between agencies, but also between programs within a single agency. One of the key lessons that we learned from ERA implementation was the need for the federal government to the maximum extent possible to speak with one voice. Consistent guidance will be the key. Different guidance from different federal agencies is not efficient and will decrease, in our opinion, overall accountability over these public funds. I have no doubt that the PRAC and the government accountability professionals around the country are up to this challenge. Our citizens deserve nothing less. Sandra, I want to thank you again for the opportunity today. That concludes my statement, and we look forward to working with you 
and the federal inspectors general and the federal grantor agencies uh, in the future over these funds. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pointer. Please mute your mic. Our next speaker is Commissioner Robert Acero Angelo of the New Jersey Department of Labor and Workforce Development. As commissioner, Mr. Acero Angelo oversees the state's diverse services to New Jersey workers. From 2010 to 2017, Mr. Acero Angelo served as Eastern Regional Representative for the U.S. Department of Labor. Additionally, he has served on the White House Hurricane Sandy Task Force, the White House Task Force on Puerto Rico, Regional U.S. Interagency Councils on Homelessness, and FEMA's Recovery Support Function Leadership Group. Commissioner Acero Angelo, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sandra, and thanks to the PRAC uh, for having me here today to talk about what's going on in New Jersey. Uh, the crush of layoffs and furloughs accompanying COVID-19 have clearly overwhelmed state unemployment agencies nationwide, and New Jersey is no different. We are seeing a volume of claims exponentially higher than any time in our history. The first week of this crisis alone saw a 1,600% increase in volume. Two weeks later, we hit our all-time high watermark of 214,000 initial unemployment claims. To put this in perspective, the most new claims in a week after Superstorm Sandy was just 45,000. It was after Sandy where I saw the confusion created by hundreds of government programs with thousands of eligibility requirements. At the time, I was serving as the Eastern Regional Representative for the U.S. Department of Labor, was on detail to FEMA's Joint Field Office here in New Jersey. After the devastation of Sandy, it took years of back and forth with multiple state and federal agencies for SBA loans, FEMA buyouts, rental assistance, or HUD rebuilding or mortgage assistance funding to help tens of thousands of New Jerseyans. Over the past 10 weeks alone, our agency has paid benefits to nearly 1 million New Jersey workers and $4.3 billion has been issued as much needed income replacement. So to call our current but necessary economic situation an avalanche would be an understatement. While we've been working around the clock to find solutions to problems weighing on our systems and processes, it's clear action needs to be taken on a federal level. I know you all share my belief that coordinated efforts and constant communication between state and federal governments are key to the success of the important work we do together. I am proud of the respectful, collegial, and honest relationship we have with our regional and local U.S. Department of Labor offices of Inspector General. But communication and information sharing can only do so much when regulatory and IT systems across state and federal governments don't allow for effective services to our customers and efficient methods to combat fraud, especially when it comes to data sharing. In, lab in the labor realm, there needs to be a singular federal solution when it comes to modernizing our unemployment system. There is an impracticality to every state having a different system for the same federally mandated process. A combined solution will not only make it easier for our practitioners and customers, but to coordinate and streamline anti-fraud measures as well. Recently, the OIG had to go state by state in search of IP addresses of those filing for unemployment online to help with anti-fraud efforts. Simultaneously, our state partners at the National Association of State Workforce Agencies were compiling the same information. The CARES Act and the immediate implementation of a new multi-billion dollar programs it called for brought into immediate and clear view the challenges of the current system. One of the biggest was and is the implementation of Section 2102 of the CARES Act, which created the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, or PUA as it's known, to support independent contractors, self-employed, and others usually ineligible for standard unemployment. Speaking for New Jersey and other states, I presume, we're thrilled workers not traditionally eligible for benefits are getting support, but it's presented an entirely new set of challenges for systems that have been in place for a certain type of worker who have paid premiums into our unemployment insurance system and shared their wage records, now serving all workers who haven't been paying in premiums and whom we have no records for. Imagine if every VA hospital was told they must immediately start accepting any patient who ever served in the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, or wore any uniform. Eventually, they would be able to assist this population, but in the short term, when that care is most crucial, it's obvious to see the challenge and delays it would pose to its typical traditional patients. We have spent the past three months 
working with other states to get answers, guidance, and solutions to these unprecedented times, and exploring outside-the-box solutions to meet the unthinkable demand we were, were facing and the clear mandate from Congress to support them and to do so quickly. Meanwhile, the U.S. Department of Labor was doubling down on strict guidance to states, warning that many ideas to speed or streamline benefit payments could not be enacted by states without putting our entire unemployment system, including billions in new CARES Act funding, at risk. As recently as May 27th, two months after the CARES Act passed, a letter was sent from the U.S. Department of Labor OIG to the Assistant Secretary for Employment and Training Administration and the Solicitor's Office outlining its disagreement about April guidance, which actually gave states flexibility to start paying PUA and its monetary benefits to workers based on self-certification. I want to be very, very, very clear. This is in no way a critique of the U.S. Department of Labor, ETA, or OIG. We've all been put in an unreasonable circumstance. If the New Jersey State Legislature passed and the governor signed a bill that had our State Department of Labor create and fund five new programs to serve close to a fifth of our residents effective immediately, having clear processes and regulations as quick as residents needed them would be impossible. One reason why New Jersey is in a strong position on income verification is because this past January, the legislature passed a bill with overwhelmingly bipartisan majorities, by the way, which the governor signed, allowing our State Department of Treasury to share any information, including but not limited to tax information statements, reports, audit files, and returns with the State Department of Labor. This has and will allow for more accuracy and reduce overpayments as we implement this new and complex federal programs. Access to IRS federal tax filing records would be a tremendous resource to properly assess eligibility and the correct weekly base amount, not just for PUA, but for all benefit programs across every state. Providing limited access for federally funded programs would improve the efficiency and accuracy in the implementation of these new programs created to address needs as a result of COVID-19. Despite the high level complexities of these new laws, we have a responsibility to be informative and transparent with our customers, the workers of New Jersey. Our experience after Sandy has helped inform our efforts in the Garden State to increase transparency and, transparency and clarify communications about benefits to New Jersey workers. We have written and designed, only to rewrite and redesign, guides to help our customers through these pro ever-changing processes. This includes being transparent and honest about what unemployment certification questions mean and what effect each of their answers will have in their application, positive or negative. This transparency in no way reduces the questionnaire's ability to ensure proper payments, and it certainly does not redu reduce the consequences or penalties for claimants attesting to false answers. While I'm proud of the work our teams and our counterparts around the country have been doing for their workers at this unprecedented time, we know it can be done better. With this as a guiding principle, I look forward to working with your offices further. Thank you for your time and for bringing attention to these important issues. Thank you, Commissioner Sarah Angelo. Please mute your mic. We greatly appreciate the insights provided today, and that concludes our first panel. Michael, I'll turn the floor back over to you. Great. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you to our state and local government panelists, IG Miguel, uh, Mr. Pointer, and Commissioner Asaro Angelo. Thank you so much for kicking off today's session. Very much appreciate your insights. Um, our next panel is going to be on business, financial, and nonprofits and their perspectives on oversight and issues created by the response to the pandemic. That panel is going to be moderated by, the, by Inspector General Mike Ware, who is the Inspector General for the Small Business Administration. Um, and he's going to be joined by Tony Wilkinson, Tim Delaney, and Neil Bradley, who can turn on their videos now. And I am going to hand the microphone over to Mike Ware to kick off the next panel. Mike? Thank you, Mike. It's my pleasure to introduce our second panel, providing perspectives from key stakeholders in the business, financial, and nonprofit sectors. Our first panelist is Tony Wilkinson. For more than 30 years, Mr. Wilkinson has served as president and chief executive officer of the National Association of Guaranteed Government Lenders the only national trade association that represents the, seven, the SBA 7A lending industry. It has been a pleasure to know Tony and to partner with him. He works closely with agency executives and the Small Business Committee in ensuring the continued stability and availability of the 7A program. 
Mr. Wilkinson, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Well, Mr. Ware, thank you for inviting me today. It's always a pleasure to see you. Uh, it's my privilege to, to today to present a lending industry perspective on the implementation of the Paycheck Protection Program, commonly known as PPP. As Mike mentioned, Nagel is a national trade association representing private sector lenders that participate in SBA 7A loan program. As it did after 9-11 and after the financial crisis a decade ago, Congress turned to SBA and its private sector partners to deliver this much needed aid to small businesses. In just two months, over 5,400 lenders have received approvals for almost 4.5 million triple P loans totaling over $510 billion, an enormous feat. But the data is not the only impress impressive aspect of the triple P program. There are countless stories of success and hope behind the millions of loans. I wish I could say that participation in this program has been easy. It has not. Despite the heroic efforts made by PPP stakeholders, the program's implementation strategy as spearheaded by Treasury has in many ways been abysmal. On the very day that PPP loans were made available, SBA's Office of Inspector General issued a white paper noting how essential it is that the government provide clear guidance and training before loan funds are dispersed under programs like PPP. Clearly, those implementing the program did not heed that warning. Since early April, even while more than 4 million PPP loans were being approved, Treasury and SBA have been issuing program guidance on a rolling basis. 15 interim final rules, 48 frequently asked questions, plus notices, forms, etc., with still more to come. The decision by Treasury to dole out piecemeal and sometimes inconsistent guidance has chilled the willingness of many small businesses to even apply for loans during the second round of funding and has caused many businesses to return dispersed loans out of fear of doing something wrong. If anyone in the IG community thinks this is an appropriate way to implement a program as large, as complex, and as important as PPP, I welcome your explanation. Participating lenders pleaded for exactly what SBA's Office of Inspector General recommended, clear and complete guidance before the first loan was ever made. Now think about this for a moment. A program designed on the premise of forgiving loans had no process by which to forgive loans until last week. And even today, no lender has the complete guidance that it needs to process a PPP loan transaction from start to finish. In over 30 years, I've never seen a scenario where the government has put small business borrowers and lenders on more perilous and uncertain grounds. Nagel has provided a written statement for the record, and our statement provides a number of common sense solutions to the issues we are raising. While our statement is far too long to cover in my allotted time, here are some highlights, and I think you will notice the trend. Congress sets the maximum loan size at $10 million. Treasury told borrowers that all loans over $2 million will be fully reviewed. Congress set the maximum maturity at 10 years. Treasury unilaterally decided that two years was long enough. Congress set a maximum interest rate of 4%. Treasury decided that 1% was enough. Congress specifically waived the standard 7A credit elsewhere test. Treasury imposed a new self-test requiring borrowers to consider their current business activity and their ability to access sources of liquidity to support their ongoing operations. That sounds an awful lot like the very test Congress discarded. Congress pre prescribed a detailed forgiveness formula. Treasury unilaterally decided to impose a 75% payroll requirement and now asserts that it cannot change the requirement it set. Congress required that lenders be paid processing fees within five days after loan disbursement. Now, two months after the first loans were made, SBA is just starting to pay the required fees with an added loophole that the government will not pay fees for loans subsequently deemed ineligible by Treasury or the SBA. And please keep in mind that the eligibility requirements continue to be changed. Congress statutorily required forgiveness regulations to be published within 30 days. Treasury and SBA failed to comply until day 56. The industry and SBA's Office of Inspector General asked for comprehensive guidance up front, including standard templates for the loan note and authorization. Treasury officials decided they preferred to provide guidance on a fragmentary basis through multiple IFRs and FAQs that they could amend as they saw fit and also decided just to let lenders fend for themselves when it came to translating the changing program requirements into the documents that they and their borrowers had to sign. After 
After Congress pr promised debt forgiveness for borrowers that maintained their payrolls, Treasury created an 11 page forgiveness application for all loan sizes and then estimated its completion time, including documentation gathering at only three hours, a difficult feat for most borrowers. While we understand that some documentation must be required, surely a more streamlined process could be developed, especially for the smallest loans. As you hear this list, is it any wonder why borrowers and lenders are questioning whether Treasury has set everyone up to fail? Any wonder why lenders have become seriously concerned about their PPP participation? Any wonder why borrowers of all sizes have been returning their loans out of fear of their own government? And that leads me to the story of one PPP borrower that I had the opportunity to speak with yesterday. The husband and wife who own the business help veterans with PTSD and others with depression or anger management issues. Let me share their story in their own words. We received a PPP loan with the explicit understanding that if approved for the loan, and if we used the funds for payroll, rent, et cetera, the loan would be forgiven after the eight week period. Now that it is time to start applying for forgiveness, the forgiveness application provides terms that I am afraid will disqualify us for forgiveness and we're not part of the loan application or the loan contract. Why are the terms of PPP loans now changing midstream after we spent the money? If we would have seen the terms now listed on the forgiveness application, we would not have applied or agreed to the loan in the beginning. If our loan is not forgiven, now due to a change in the terms we agreed on and signed, and we're faced with paying a large loan payment, we simply will not be able to pay it back. It may very well put an end to our business and make life really difficult for us personally. We feel like the PPP loan was the devil knocking at our door when we were down, and unfortunately, we let him in. How sad is that? Their loan was for $27,000, which means an average payroll of just over $10,000 per month. Two to three employees who work with veterans with PTSD, and they are literally losing sleep every night over their PPP loan. The implementation of this critical program has been troubling. Borrowers and lenders still do not know all the rules of engagement, and that begs the question, why? This committee has a critical role to play in this, in this discussion, and we need your help. If the current path of fragmented implementation is not corrected quickly, PPP could face a bruised legacy, and more importantly, the small businesses that desperately need PPP may not receive the assistance that it was created to provide. With your help, the legacy of the program can be that millions of small businesses were served by a nationwide network of lenders that helped their neighbors during one of the country's times of need. I look forward to continuing this dialogue. And Mike, thanks for having me today. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Our next speaker is Mr. Neil Bradley, Executive Vice President and Chief Policy Officer at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. At the Chamber, Bradley is responsible for aligning the organization's overall policy priorities and advocacy efforts. He oversees several major policy divisions within the Chamber, including many that are relevant to our discussion today. Mr. Bradley, we appreciate you joining us and look forward to your comments. Well, thank you, Mr. Ware. Uh, on behalf of the United States Chamber of Commerce and the three million businesses of all industries, sizes, sectors, and local and state chambers of commerce and trade associations, it's an honor to be with you today to present the views of the U.S. Chamber about the important work of your committee. The United States has faced uh, many challenges in recent years, but perhaps none were as sudden, as widespread, or as deep as the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the necessary measures that have been taken to arrest its spread. The government has had to simultaneously respond to an immense public health challenge and the fallout from an extraordinary shutdown in commerce and economic activity. Congress responded to this unprecedented situation with unprecedented speed, enacting four measures that to date are also unprecedented both in scope and in the level of fiscal response. The U.S. Chamber has supported these efforts, and we appreciate the bipartisan cooperation that led to the enactment of each of these four bills. The Chamber has also consistently supported oversight mechanisms in times of crisis when taxpayer dollars are used for a lifeline for the economy. 
we believe that the work that this committee will do is essential, not just to protect the interests of taxpayers, but to support public confidence and better policymaking in the future. The work you do will also set an important tone and serve as a model for others. There's no shortage of individuals and organizations willing to engage in Monday morning quarterbacking, suggesting with the advantage of hindsight, what should have been done. Perhaps Congress's own experience is illustrative here. On March 6 of this year, the Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act was signed into law. Less than a week later, the House of Representatives began moving forward with the Families First Coronavirus Response Act that among other things, provided additional funding left out of the first bill less than a week earlier. Seven days after enactment of that bill, the Senate was considering what we now know as the CARES Act. The situation evolved that quickly that Congress had to update its response. But it's not just that they're moving quickly, they're also consistently amending what they've done in prior bills, even though the ink is barely dry on those previous statutes. I point this out not because it's a bug, but rather a feature. In a volatile environment with uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, it's important that policymakers be nimble and willing to evolve the think their thinking even to the point of changing directions. It would be easy now, but patently unfair to say to Congress, why didn't you get it right the first time? We think the same level of understanding should be extended to others in government and in the private sector who had to make decisions in the same volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment. With that in mind, the Chamber offers five suggestions for your consideration. First, businesses, individuals, and state and local governments should be held to account for complying with the rules and guidance as they existed at the time of their action, not as subsequently modified and appropriate forbearance should be provided for compliance when the rules were ambiguous or issued with virtually no time to achieve compliance. You just heard Tony talk about the evolutions of the PPP program. In less than two months, 15 interim final rules. Frequently asked questions have been modified 16 times already. Sole proprietors and ind independent contractors were eligible to apply for PPP per the government on April 10th, but the regulations detailing the limitations for their participation didn't come out until four days later. Similarly, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act included an unprecedented requirement that businesses with fewer than 500 employees provide paid sick and family leave under certain circumstances to be reimbursed by the federal government. The mandate was effective April 1st, the very same day that the Department of Labor uh, posted interim final regulations. While the department wisely issued a suspension of enforcement through April 17th, it's worth recalling that this was at the very same time that millions of small businesses were simultaneously working to comply with state stay-at-home orders. The chamber encourages the committee to remember the chaotic nature of the situation as it conducts its oversight. It may also be worth considering documenting the involving nature of these programs to create a baseline to guide others in their oversight. Second, recognizing the economic circumstances have and continue to unfold in unanticipated ways, deference should be given to good faith certifications of program eligibility and compliance. Congress, the administration, and the Federal Reserve wisely utilize good faith certifications when it comes to PPP eligibility and employee retention requirements under the Main Street lending programs. Some small businesses applied for or received PPP funding with the expectation that they would experience a significant drop in revenue only to find that they were able to modify their business operations in a manner that mitigated revenue loss. These small businesses should be applauded for their ingenuity, not have their certifications made as part of the PPP process, second guess months or even years later. Similarly, we expect many mid-sized and large employers to apply for and receive Main Street loans, only to later discover that economic conditions over the course of that loan do not permit them to continue operations and employment levels as they intended at the time of application. The Federal Reserve has stated that a borrower should make commercially reasonable efforts, quote, quote, end quote, to maintain payroll and retain employees. Some lawmakers are already indicating that they expect employers who receive a loan to do more. 
this type of uncertainty and ambiguity in the process, the fear that uh, a business will be second guessed in the commercial business decisions that it will make will only deter participation in the programs that Congress has created to help arrest this economic slide. Third, in conducting any audits, the committee should recognize that many businesses were to ask to take urgent action to implement government policies. The American business community is proud of its role in stepping forward to provide everything from personal protective equipment to testing sites to the infrastructure necessary to carry out the PPP program. In emergencies, speed is of the essence. Acting quickly is essential to both medical and economic recovery. But speed requires that many or normal operational processes be set aside. While we should absolutely learn from what worked well and what didn't, we should not necessarily find fault with every action that in hindsight we wish had occurred differently. Fourth, oversight must be guided by facts and not used as a tool for recriminations against politically disfavored industries or entities. There's already growing concern that congressional oversight will in part focus on companies or sectors that various elected officials view as unworthy of assistance, irrespective of whether or not they qualify under the terms of the programs in question. Politically motivated oversight not only erodes public confidence, it disincentivizes businesses from taking advantage of the programs created by Congress, ultimately making recovery more difficult. There will be likely be numerous requests for this committee to investigate entities not based on evidence of wrongdoing, but because of a belief that an industry or entity should never have been allowed to receive assistance in the first place. As inspector generals, you have a long history of ensuring that oversight is free from partisan considerations. The business community is grateful that you will no doubt ensure that the work of this committee is fair and that its efforts are not influenced by efforts to stigmatize certain sectors or entities. Fifth and finally, the committee should attempt to ascertain the extent to which the recovery efforts have been hampered by antiquated technology systems. From businesses seeking to coordinate the supply of PPP, access small business administration loans, file tax reforms with the Internal Revenue Service, or individuals accessing unemployment compensation, the chambers heard of repeated complaints about technological breakdowns at government agencies. It's understandable that the unprecedented scope of the crisis would strain even the best systems, but it's worth understanding the extent to which the problems are rooted in a failure to modernize state and federal IT systems. In conclusion, thank you for the opportunity to provide this input. The Chamber of Commerce stands ready to work with you in support of meaningful oversight that bolsters public confidence, protects taxpayers, and improves our nation's ability to respond to future challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. Thank you for your readiness just now. Our final panelist is Tim Delaney, the president and CEO of the National Council of Nonprofits. Mr. Delaney is an attorney and policy advocate who has successfully argued before the U.S. Supreme Court, testified before Congress, negotiated in the White House, and helped prosecute the impeachment and removal of a governor. Since 2008, Tim has applied his diverse leadership experiences to help nonprofits across the country. Mr. Delaney, this floor is yours. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. I appreciate the invitation by PRAC for the National Council of Nonprofits to join you all today to present the insights and concerns of the nonprofit community. In my remarks, I want to talk about three things. First, attendance. Second, provide insights into the nonprofit community. And third, um, conclude by highlighting areas where um, accountability, oversight, and transparency are desperately needed all in five to six minutes. So who is depending on whom? You'll not hear me or my nonprofit colleagues ever use the term government-funded nonprofits. That phrase has the focus flipped. In reality, governments depend on nonprofits. Governments hire nonprofits to provide vital services in communities across the country. Governments simply could not get their work done without nonprofit partners hired to deliver services more efficiently and more effectively than governments can perform. This, the public also depends on charitable nonprofits. Every day during this pandemic, you cannot watch the news without seeing images of long lines at food banks, home care providers braving the virus, 
and faith leaders and musicians inspiring us through virtual presentations. In better times and in worse, charitable nonprofits are where Americans turn for help and healing, insights and inspiration, truth and justice. The public depends on nonprofits. And we nonprofits depend on inspectors general. You probably weren't expecting that, but it's very true. There is no one department or one agency in the federal government dedicated to nonprofits. We have a Commerce Department, we have the Small Business Administration, we have many more agencies and departments that really focus on the health and well being of for profit entities. But there is not one that's dedicated to the health and well being of nonprofits on which everyone else depends. That means that we need every inspector general to recognize his or her responsibility for ensuring that government programs work with and for the missions of charitable nonprofits without erecting barriers or imposing costly and burdensome processes. Here's a specific example. During the Great Recession, almost half the nonprofits in the country that had government contracts reported that governments were not paying them on time, meaning it was actually causing problems with their operations um, because governments were paying later than the governments had agreed to in writing. That meant, in effect, that nonprofits were being asked to subsidize government operations, um, sometimes for more than a year. So uh, we have seen that that's actually not even the worst problem that nonprofits suffered then, and we're starting to see and hear of those problems today. Um, and I would point you to the government nonprofit contracting and grants uh, research that highlighted um, in my written statement um, just to show again the importance of inspectors general uh, to hold government accountable. We depend on you. So permit me to share some more data about nonprofits and the importance of nonprofits and how we operate. Collectively, charitable nonprofits are the third largest private employer in the United States. We're larger manufacturing even. But those facts, um, come from 2017 data from the Department of Labor, which is not scheduled to release another set of data about nonprofit employment until 2024. That delay is unacceptable. That is not transparency. Um, we need to have policymakers equipped to make informed decisions with the latest data that is available and not just have it sit there until 2024. Um, in the interest of transparency, the Department of Labor needs to release nonprofit employment data much more frequently so policymakers can make informed decisions. When they ask us how many nonprofits are now newly unemployed, our local uh, constituents are depending on them, there is no answer to give yet. And yet, while collectively charitable nonprofits are the third largest employer, it's important to recognize that individually, most nonprofits are small to mid-sized, situated in local com communities meeting local needs. 97% of charitable nonprofits have budgets less than $5 million. 92% have less than $1 million. For every huge Harvard or Mayo Clinic with full and legal finance departments, there are thousands upon thousands of smaller nonprofits with only pro bono help at best uh, or just the sheer grit uh, to teach themselves because they focus all of their energy on meeting their missions. My point here is one size does not fit all. We need to have forms that accommodate um, nonprofits and recognize the very different levels that exist. Here's another reality. Charitable nonprofits are, more, uh, are the most transparent segment of the US economy. Charitable nonprofits are open books because of the Form 990 information, tax returns, that we file with the IRS every year, post on our websites for the public to see. And then they also appear on GuideStar's website 24 seven. Anyone, anywhere in the world can see our finances, our salaries, our focus areas. The IRS knows who our donors are and can root out bad actors, as can state charity regulators all because we fully and proudly disclose this information. And that's the way we want it. 
because if people have doubts, concerns, uh, are uncertain about who we are and what we do, then they won't give their dollars, their time, or their talent to our individual missions. Now, let me dive deeper into the need for transparency and accountability and oversight regarding the CARES Act. I'll start with the obvious, the Paycheck Protection Program. The SBA Inspector General, thank you, Michael, has already flagged a glaring example of what most of us see as a moving of the goalpost without authority of law. I'm talking about the imposition of the mandate the PPP borrows spend 75% of loan funds on payroll costs. We agree with the IG's analysis and cited it in the public comments that the National Council of Nonprofits submitted on the interim final rules. There are other examples of these moving uh, goalposts. Uh, you heard uh, Neil talk earlier about the SBA having issued 14 uh, sets of interim final rules and another set by Treasury and 48 FAQs. People and nonprofits in particular are very nervous about which set of evolving standards will be applied by um, uh, states, localities, um, uh, and federal agencies uh, that are then doing the audits. What will be, we be held against? Uh, because when we sign the document on a certain date, that's what ought to apply as opposed to these moving uh, standards. Um, we also heard the same thing from Tony for the National Association of uh, Guaranteed Government Loans. We need oversight here. Still on the PPP, terrible nonprofits cannot understand why SBA and Treasury have steadfastly refused to disclose data about the success rates or non-success rates of nonprofits applying for PPP loans. As I wrote in my written submission, the very first question on the online application is, what type of organization are you? Why can't or why won't SBA and Treasury account to the nonprofit community, account to policymakers, account to the public, why charities were shoved to the back of the applicant line, as we have heard repeatedly, extensively from anecdotal stories? we need to have the evidence to show that we have been pushed to the back of the line so it doesn't happen anymore. That's why we see transparency is desperately needed. And that's why we ask the IG's help. Further, even that one question that was added at the very beginning of the PPP loan application uh, to add 501c3 status, the rest of the form remain designed specifically for for-profit entities, such as ownership percentages, which cause confusion, delay, and stop some nonprofits from even applying because nonprofits by law don't have private owners. And so nonprofits are being asked to have really been shoved into a system that's designed for for-profits. We're very grateful that Congress included us in um, some of these uh, programs, but we need to make sure that the programs are then designed to accommodate nonprofits upon whom everybody else is relying. Uh, last two points on other areas of concerns of the CARES Act. First, the Labor Department and its interpretation regarding the unemployment insurance for self-insured employers. The department issued guidance on April 27th, interpreting section 2103 of the CARES Act that at best, the, the department's interpretation is nonsensical. And we've heard many other um, adjectives describing what came out. The department asserts that reimbursing employers under the unemployment system must pay upfront 100% of the cost paid by the state unemployment system to former employees, and then wait for months or longer for overwhelmed state unemployment offices to then reimburse half of that amount as guaranteed under the CARES Act. This is not inconsequential. There are some nonprofits, one in Maine, that's gonna have to, that has received a bill for $600,000. Another in Kansas, $1.5 million. For them to go out and first submit that money and wait months and months for some of, for half of it to come back as the CARES Act demands, all of a sudden, they have to lay off more employees in order to front load the expenditure. 
that doesn't make sense. Uh, it is very harmful and it's an unnecessary interpretation, especially when Congress directed specifically that it be interpreted with maximum flexibility. I'm basically echoing the same thing that New Jersey Commissioner Sara Angelo mentioned earlier. What we need to do is make sure that in light of the fact that members of Congress and two bills also reject this interpretation, that the opaque reasoning of the Labor Department be exposed. We need to have investigation and clarity. We've heard and seen various state officials say, don't do this to you, um, to us as states to do this to nonprofits. So I implore you, please look at this. Finally, nonprofits with more than 500 employees. The Treasury Department and Federal Reserve have announced several Main Street loan facilities, but they've only made nonspecific statements about intending to create a loan program for nonprofit organizations. That's too late. Those nonprofits need help now. Nonprofits such as YMCAs and YWCAs that have been pro providing around the clock services in our communities, including childcare for doctors, nurses, and other first responders are larger than 500 employees, but have not been able to access uh, relief under the CARES Act and are left waiting for this last crumb of hope. We must ask, what is taking so long? Why is the deliberative process so opaque? And what bias exists within the government that cause officials to treat nonprofits adversely and disparately? We recognize that nonprofits and governments are serving the same constituents in the same communities with the community and constituents welfare in mind. We are partners, we need to be working together. Uh, and I commit the National Non Council of Nonprofits and nonprofits across the country. We care. We want to work with our partners in government. And I, again, will commit to the National Council of Nonprofits to be working with PRAC, uh, to be working with Congress, to be working with whomever to make sure that these programs as they roll out are fair uh, so that we are able to take care of Americans in local communities across this country. With that, I thank you very much for this opportunity and I wish you well, um, I wish us all well in these times. Mike? Thank you very much, Mr. Delaney. We appreciate the perspectives and statements of all the panelists of the business, financial and nonprofit sectors. Thank you all for presenting. This concludes our second panel. Michael, I'll turn the floor back over to you. Great. Thanks, Mike. And uh, thank you, Mr. Wilkinson, Mr. Delaney, Mr. Bradley for a, a uh, very informative panel and your insights on the impact on the business, financial, and nonprofit uh, sectors of our economy. Um, you've given us much to think about uh, and appreciate uh, the, the, your words. Um, we are now through our first two panels. We have two panels to go. Uh, the next panel is going to be about healthcare. Um, we're going to take a short break of uh, three minutes, four minutes. Uh, we'll restart at 3.15, um, so uh, look forward to seeing everybody again at 3.15.
Welcome back, everybody. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to uh, begin our the second part of our program with our third panel. Um, and that third panel is going to be about healthcare issues and we're going to hear perspectives from healthcare providers and public health experts. The uh, panel is moderated by Christy Grimm, the principal deputy and secretary general at the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, it's my pleasure to turn the panel over to you, Christy, um, and we'll ask the panelists for the panel to turn their screens. Thank you, Michael. It's my pleasure to introduce our third panel, providing stakeholder perspectives from public health experts and advocates. Our first panelist is Dr. Ashish Jha, director of the Harvard Global Health Institute. Dr. Jha is a practicing general internist and also professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Jha's research endeavors to focus on improving the quality and costs of healthcare systems with a specialized focus on the impact of policies. Dr. Jha has published over 200 papers in prestigious journals and heads a personal blog that focuses on using statistical data research to improve health quality. Dr. Jha, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Great, um, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for having me on. My name is Ashish Jha, and, and as mentioned, I am a practicing physician and the director of the Harvard Global Health Institute. And today I'm here to talk to you about testing and the pandemic uh, caused by the SARS coronavirus. Um, we are in the middle of the worst global pandemic in a century. Uh, nearly 2 million Americans have been infected and more than 100,000 Americans have died. How exactly did we get here? The first case of coronavirus in our country was identified on January 20th the exact same date that the first case was identified in South Korea. And these are tales of two countries that elucidate what has happened and tell us what the US needs to do next. As of today, as I mentioned, America has nearly 2 million cases and more than 100,000 deaths. South Korea has 11,600 cases and 273 deaths. They have 20, we have 20 times more cases per capita and more than 60 times as many deaths per capita as South Korea. There are, when we think about combating the coronavirus, there are three main strategies that exist that we know of today. One is social distancing. The second is wearing masks. And the third is testing, tracing, and supportive isolation. The failure of our nation to get a testing infrastructure in place is the primary reason that we had a massive outbreak in the United States, leading our country to have to shut down for nearly two months. Between January 20th and mid-March, we had essentially no testing capacity at all because of the failures of the federal government, the CDC, the FDA, and their entire federal government apparatus. Because of that, we had no choice but to shut our country down for nearly two months. And even today, as testing has gotten better, and I will lay out that it is not anywhere near where it needs to be, um, the best estimates are that we are identifying one in five coronavirus cases on any given day. That another way to say it is we're missing 80% of the cases that are out there. And as the nation opens up and as we face turmoil with people in the streets, the bottom line is we are not performing enough tests to keep this country safe. So how much testing do we need? Our institute has estimated that we need at least a million tests a day for a nation our size and for the outbreak our size to get the country op to open up safely. Ours is the most conservative estimate of all the academic and public health leaders out there. The Safra Center has estimated that we need between three and five million tests a day. And Paul Romer, the Nobel laureate, has estimated that we need at least 30 million tests a day. Whatever the number is, whichever expert you believe, no one believes that the current level of testing, which is approximately 400,000 tests a day, is nearly enough. Congress has, through the CARES Act, uh, allocated $25 billion, primarily to states, but, but also to the CDC and other entities, to ramp up testing in our nation. And Congress has also asked the Department of Health and Human Services to make a national testing strategy plan. HHS recently released its plan and I would like to 
say what I think most public health experts believe, which is that the plan released by HHS a week ago was disappointing and wholly inadequate. The plan basically had two features. It suggested that the 300,000 tests a day we are doing currently is adequate and put all the responsibilities for any further ramping up of testing to states. Let's be very clear about this. While states have an important role to play in testing in the United States, states cannot do it alone. And the reason states cannot do it alone is because the testing supply chains are national and international supply chains. It makes no sense for our country to have to have states competing with each other, states competing with private businesses, states competing with other nations to uh, to secure those supply chains to ramp up testing. We need a, uh, we need a national uh, testing strategic plan that is run and led by the federal government with states playing an integral role, but not doing it alone. Beyond that, we also are in desperate need of data, high quality data on the state of testing in our nation. We still do not have such data. While states continue to collect and report data, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, our federal public health agency, continues to fail to provide accurate, reliable data on an ongoing basis in a way uh, that allows for uh, public health officials and state officials to really uh, assess where we are on testing and how to move forward. States are, as I mentioned, collecting and reporting these data on their own, but they're getting very little guidance from the CDC. And then when the CDC has involved itself in reporting of, of testing data, the data are often old, they're often not updated on an ongoing basis, and the CDC has made several important errors, mixing, for instance, testing on virus with testing for antibodies, which are two completely different testing modalities into one in a way that has caused confusion in the marketplace. So to wrap up, what I would say to the inspectors general as you are on the phone and thinking about the accountability that we need from the federal government, we are at a crossroad. The nation is opening up after a two month shutdown. There is civil unrest in our streets. The pandemic continues to rage. We have had 100,000 Americans die, a calamity that we have not experienced in the history of our country. All of the best models suggest that another 100,000 Americans are gonna die over the next three to four months. We continue to have nearly 1,000 deaths a day. The way we are going to make, and that is just actually, let me be clear, that is just over the summer into the fall. Plus every public health expert agrees we are gonna have a second wave, a much larger wave in the fall where the number of cases and the number of deaths are likely to rise. It is entirely possible that by next spring, by the time we might get a vaccine, three to 400,000 Americans will have died from this disease. This is wholly preventable. It is completely up to us whether an additional two to 300,000 Americans die or not. But what it will take is smart policy and accountability from the federal government. That means we need substantially uh, increased levels of testing, we need to be testing people who are uh, infected. We are people with symptoms. We need to be testing in high risk places such as nursing homes and hospitals. We need to be testing to keep people safe in our, in our communities. And we need to be testing to keep the number of cases down. So let me wrap up by saying, um, we as a country have so far, uh, there is broad consensus in the public health community, both in the US and across the globe, that the US has so far failed to respond effectively to this disease. Congress through both the CARES Act and the Paycheck Protection Act has put in resources for the federal government uh, and states to begin to address these issues more effectively. But we need federal leadership and we need accountability to make sure those dollars are being spent in a way that keep the American people safe. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to all of you. Uh, I'm grateful. Thank you, Dr. Jai. You've given us a lot to think about. Uh, please go ahead and you've muted your mic. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ernest Grant, president of the American Nurses Association. Dr. Grant has more than 30 years of nursing experience and is an internationally recognized burn care and fire safety expert. 
Dr. Grant also serves as adjunct faculty for the UNC Chapel Hill School of Nursing, where he works with undergraduate and graduate nursing students in the classroom and clinical settings. Dr. Grant, we're so pleased you could join us. The floor is yours. Please go ahead and unmute your mic. Thank you, Ms. Graham. I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to submit testimony for the record and for convening this hearing on oversight and transparency related to the CARES Act and other emergency COVID related legislation. My colleagues and communities across the country have been on the front lines of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. I salute them during National Nurses Month in what has been an extraordinary year of the nurse. I'm especially proud of the many nurses who have given their time and skills to care for people in underserved rural and appointed shortage areas. As I'm sure you are aware, this pandemic has disproportionately impacted communities of color in both infection rates and death rates, in large part due to the existing health disparities in access to care. Communities of color also make up a disproportionate share of the central frontline workforce, who has not had the option to work from home remotely or shelter in place. As the president of the American Nurses Association, I am pleased to share with you my perspective on behalf of my organization and its members on the current state of healthcare with respect to the CARES Act and other legislation, as well as the work that still needs to be done. I would first like to emphasize the need to, for spending on mental health services for frontline providers. The COVID-19 pandemic has placed an enormous strain on the providers, including RNs, who provide care to individuals with COVID. Rates of anxiety, depression, and even suicides among frontline providers have been covered extensively. The stress of inadequate supplies of personal protection equipment and caring for patients, family members, and self with a novel disease has created an enormous mental health burden on these providers which will likely take months, if not years, to rectify. We recommend oversight actively to ensure that agencies such as the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration have the capacity to develop and target effective resources and interventions to groups affected by the pandemic, particularly frontline workers. ANA supported the inclusion of the $100 billion for healthcare uh, providers and hospitals in the CARES Act as well as the distribution of $76 billion to healthcare providers through the Paycheck Protection Program and Healthcare Enhancement Act. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted providers in all settings in a myriad of ways. This includes physical and mental hardships incurred from caring for COVID-19 patients on the front line, as well as protecting themselves and their loved ones when going home at night. It also includes the financial and employment losses to facilities and providers associated with patients, foregoing care and elective procedures. While ANA agrees with the administration's methodologies used to distribute CARES Act fund, I urge the committee to ensure that this methodology was carried out accurately to ensure that funds were distributed in an equitable manner. Furthermore, I urge the committee to ensure that the funds distributed to hospitals both through the PPP and Healthcare Enhancement Act and the CARES Act have been spent to ensure, safe and ensure a safe and adequate workforce. This includes an adequate number of registered nurses to ensure safe, high quality care and the personal protective equipment necessary to provide that care. Personal protective equipment is still scarce in many healthcare settings. In the most recent ANA survey of more than 14,000 nurses addressing the time frame of May 15th through May 31st, almost half of the respondents experienced shortages of PPEs and 43% said that their facility is decontaminating N95 respirators for reuse. More than half of these respondents say they feel unsafe using decontaminated respirators. ANA does not support the use of decontamination methods as a standard practice. However, we have acknowledged that this is a crisis capacity strategy. We recognize that the oversight body engaged with the FDA about the needs to expeditiously research the effectiveness of various decontamination methods for reuse of PPEs by nurses and other healthcare professionals. We also urge additional oversight to ensure a return to best practices as soon as possible. 
Many have learned over the past few months the, the ever increasing value of the advanced practice registered nurse uh, plays in all communities. APRNs across the country have trust, are trusted clinicians and ensure that millions of Americans have access to primary care services and critical care services needs during their, this national emergency. APRNs are ready and willing to continue to lead care teams now and in the future to ensure clinicians are available to provide the quality of care that is expected in every community. APRNs must have the support of payers and their employers to work to the full extent of their training and education. However, we must not forget the value of RNs in community and clinical care as well. As we address the realities of the importance of continuing care of underlying conditions, especially during a pandemic, registered nurses must be recognized for the value that they bring. As the most trusted profession for 18 years in a row, nurses are the key to the continuum of care and preventing unnecessary deaths as well as hospitalizations, especially in communities of color who face disproportionate health and economic disparities. I encourage you to review the impact of the Medicare's emergency flexibility supporting APRN care and identify instances in which burdensome supervision requirements can be removed permanently. As we are concerned about the capacity of all providers, the need for a physician to provide unnecessarily and oftentimes consuming uh, supervision of APRNs continues to be a costly use of valuable time causing a, a, a avoidable delays in care without showing a difference in patient outcomes. As human resources shift in times of surge and clinician burnout, we must reduce the burden on these trusted clinicians and ensure that they're able to practice at the top of their education and training. I would like for the committee to consider the important role that nonprofit organizations also play in this nation's uh, social economic fabric. These organizations have been significantly impacted by the COVID pandemic and recession. This has in turn negatively impacted their ability to perform the important advocacy and societal functions that are so crucial to the nation's people. In addition to your oversight function, I urge you to consider the impact of our current environment on the nation's nonprofits and recommend support and relief of these important organizations. In conclusion, I would particularly like to emphasize the need for the mental health services for our frontline care providers in the months and years to come. These heroes are experiencing an enormous emotional strain in providing care to those suffering from this novel disease, and this country must stand ready to support them in processing that strain even after the threat of COVID ebbs. ANA stands ready to partner with this committee on these mental health supports and to ensure that the funds appropriated through the CARES Act and other pieces of COVID-related emergency legislation are implemented equitably and for the express purpose in the legislation, and that RNs and APRNs are able to practice to the full extent of their education and training. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grant. Our final panelist is Ralph Bozella, who serves as chairman for the American Legion National Veterans Affairs and Rehabilitation Commission. The commission formulates and recommends policies on direct assistance, outreach and support for veterans and their families with the Department of Veterans Affairs to ensure that they receive the highest quality of care from the VA. Mr. Bozella was drafted and served within the US Army from 1970 through 1972. Mr. Bozella is a lifetime member of the American Legion, Veterans of Foreign Wars, and Disabled American Veterans. Mr. Bozella, thank you for your service and for joining us today. We look forward to your remarks. Thank you, Ms. Grimm. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Grimm. And on behalf of the American Legion National Commander, Bill Oxford, and the two million members of the American Legion family, thank you for this opportunity for the American Legion Veterans Affairs and Rehabilitation Commission to offer public comment and suggestions to enhance the transparency, accountability, and uh, over this overall emergency pandemic funding. On April 2nd, 2020, the American Legion reported the United States Department of Veterans Affairs will receive $19.6 billion in additional funding to fight the pandemic. The majority of the money allocated to VA will go directly 
to the Veterans Health Administration, VHA, and this funding was appropriated to provide essential medical services, vital medical and protective equipment, COVID testing kits, personal protective equipment, PPE, and medical supplies to support the growing demand for VA healthcare services. Provisions in the bill require VA to provide PPE to all home healthcare workers serving VA at home and in the community. The funding provided by the CARES Act is to ensure VA is able to provide additional care and support for the most vulnerable veterans, including those who are homeless or are at risk of homelessness, as well as residents within VA-run nursing homes and community living centers. As an organization, we have yet to determine if the $19.6 billion of COVID response funding was properly used and audited for effectiveness. We can consider an American Legion survey through our system or saving program. VA Secretary Robert Wilkie and VHA Executive in Charge Dr. Richard Stone set policy and operational procedures at its 152 medical centers during the uh, coronavirus pandemic. They call for reducing face-to-face -face care when clinically appropriate and reiterated standard pandemic mitigation practices of social distancing, um, hand washing, mask wearing, surface disinfecting, uh, asking patients to obey stay at home orders. And they even went further by severely limiting healthcare services in its hospitals and closing the doors in many of its 1400 community paced outpatient clinics. Yet veterans are still affected by COVID-19 illnesses and continue to have other non-COVID related healthcare needs. That doesn't go away. And, and within that is also, we have to consider the mental health services that were not readily available because uh, uh, mental health services continue to be a pressing need as the virus mitigation practices can have a, a, an adverse effect on mental health. On screening practices, COVID testing, emergency COVID hospital facility additions and changes, and new procedures were established for patients still needing on-site hospital and face-to-face in-person clinical services, and also for the safety of staff working in the VA facilities. Telehealth services have become the most VA used clinical treatment option so that healthcare providers can conduct appointments as they verbally and virtually examine and communicate with their patients when the face-to-face -face appointments are not available or not allowed. In addition, the providers speaking to patients on the telephone, telehealth can also be visual with the proper devices and VA has telehealth equipment such as uh, blood pressure cuffs, um, weight scales, stethoscopes, and other medical devices equipped with the wireless capabilities to send data to online nurses in charge of the veterans with telehealth equipment. VA has worked to train clinical staff and mental health staff, even in its vet centers, counseling centers, to bolster telehealth techniques and has enhanced telehealth capabilities, devices, and equipment to meet telehealth technical requirements. VA is also using telehealth for its contractors to examine veterans who have filed claims for service-connected disabilities, but not all medical examinations and appointments can be conducted through telehealth, and for certain appointments, patients must be seen and physical examinations must be conducted. VA hospitals are now becoming more open to in-person patient appointments, provided they follow strict COVID guidelines to enter the facilities. I just returned from one this morning. VA is also required by law to follow the authority of the 2018 Mission Act. Veterans who need face-to-face -face care and cannot be seen within 20 days of a VA provider order for mental health primary care or for specialty care within 28 days should be offered community care. However, the private sector, as we all know, is also affected by COVID-19 and private care in the community is not always available. And this is particularly true in rural areas. And we are finding out the VA is not always able to meet the mandates of the Mission Act and veterans, especially in rural areas, and especially older veterans are, are finding their own providers and paying for their own care when they cannot get service through the VA. This is unacceptable. And VA needs to find a way to complete its mission to care for all eligible veterans, including those living in rural areas. 
a recommendation for a future pandemic response funding is to ensure that community care options and payments are available for patients who are not properly serviced by the Mission Act. Another important development taking place is that VA hospital directors are finding better and more frequent ways to communicate with this veterans community, veteran service organizations, and veteran patients. Whereas it was common for a VA medical director to host a, a town hall meeting, maybe three a year, four a year, many are now holding weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly conference calls followed up with uh, digital notes. And this is a practice that needs to continue as COVID-19 updates and many VA healthcare issues are brought to the surface through these calls. And, uh, and we find that we're able to resolve some of the issues in a short period of time. As VA continues to deal with the veterans healthcare and COVID-19 environment, everyday changes have become the norm. As a new norm is, uh, is emerging, as medical personnel, research scientists, politicians, and really all of us, the purpose of this meeting is to learn more about coronavirus and the COVID-19 disease. Uh, and, as, and, and VA needs to continue working to protect its healthcare staff and veteran patients using electronic appointments while keeping face-to-face -face visits as the more standard mode, more preferred mode of treatment as appropriate and when possible. In addition to this, special attention needs to be given to the rural veterans and their healthcare access as well as their healthcare needs. This is a problem that needs to be resolved. As VA works to develop a, a new veterans healthcare reality, they must always include the American Legion and other veteran service organizations and its veteran patients in all of their planning implementation and evaluation processes. Perhaps uh, future pandemic response funding can help make all of this happen. Again, thank you for this opportunity. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mozella, and thank you again to Dr. Ja and Dr. Grant. Uh, and Dr. and uh, Mr. Bazella for your insights and perspectives. You've given us a great deal to think about and consider for our collective and individual oversight efforts. That concludes our third panel on healthcare. Michael, I'll turn the flo uh, floor back over to you. Thank you, Christy. And thank you again, Dr. Ja, Dr. Grant, Mr. Bazella. Uh, that was a very interesting, insightful panel and uh, appreciate you you taking the time to share your thoughts on your different areas of expertise and what are critically important areas that you work in. So thank you again. Um, we now turn to our fourth and final panel. Um, I'm going to turn the microphone over to uh, Paul Martin, who is the Inspector General at NASA. He also happens to be the Vice Chair of the PRAC, uh, and he's going to lead a panel that's going to be talking about uh, oversight issues generally about government spending and transparency issues. Um, and I'd invite Ms. Parrott, uh, Ms. McGinnis, and Mr. Grummet to turn on your videos. Um, and Paul, happy to turn over the microphone to you. Thank you, Michael. It's my pleasure to introduce our final panel that will provide perspectives on transparency and oversight of government pandemic spending. Our first panelist is Sharon Parrott, Senior Vice President for Federal Policy at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Ms. Parrott previously served as Associate Director at the Office of Management and Budget. While at OMB, she had budget and oversight responsibilities for the Departments of Labor and Education, the Social Security Administration, and the Human Service Programs at HHS. Ms. Parrott, thank you for joining us. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and thank you to the committee for the opportunity to present today. We face a crisis whose scope is unprecedented in the post-war era. The Congress and President have enacted important relief measures that are providing critical help for tens of millions of individuals and households, as well as for businesses, nonprofits, and state governments. As you well know, oversight of these measures is critical for preventing or uncovering misuse of funds, for identifying ways to do things better in the future, and for identifying who is hurt when implementation goes awry, including disparate impacts by race and gender that can arise. 
But oversight can also help the public, policymakers, and agencies understand what goes right. Without understanding what works, the public can get the mistaken impression that relief efforts overall have failed. To be clear, I have no interest in looking at relief efforts through rose-colored glasses, but our goal should be to provide the public and policymakers an accurate picture of these efforts. And many of the efforts in place are helping millions of people avert serious hardship. Now, my expertise is in low-income policies and programs, and I'll focus on several areas where important lessons can be learned or where mid-course corrections um, could be made. I'm gonna start with nutrition assistance efforts. The Families First Act included two important provisions to expand nutrition assistance to struggling individuals and households. One provision let states augment SNAP benefits, what we used to call food stamps, for, those house, for households receiving SNAP during the public health emergency. Most states quickly received federal approval to augment, state be, uh, to augment SNAP benefits, and states started providing additional benefits within weeks of the law passing. We think USDA interpreted the provision too narrowly, which had the effect of leaving out the poorest households. But the big lesson I want to focus on right now is that building on a broad-based assistance program can deliver large-scale relief to millions of people quickly. A second provision known as PEBT or pandemic EBT lets states provide meal replacement benefits through electronic benefit transfer cards, that's what the EBT stands for, for households with children who attend a school that's closed and who would have received free or reduced price meals. The PEBT program is starting to provide important help to families, but benefits are getting to children who need them far too slowly. Delays occurred for a variety of reasons. Um, I'll only talk about a few here. It took time for the Agriculture Department to be clear about the requirements. It took states time to figure out how to get help to all eligible children, particularly those not already receiving SNAP benefits, where the delivery mechanism was more complicated. The most pressing question now is what needs to happen, both legislatively and administratively, so that one, families can get help over the summer, two, families can get help if schools can't open in September in some communities, and three, families can get help if schools do open, but students don't attend every day um, as, a, as, a, as a mechanism to help promote social distancing. The broader lesson here is that it's really hard to build a new delivery system for school meals when a crisis hits and children can't attend school. That's why we should have a per we should have permanent legislation to authorize a replacement benefit program during certain kinds of crises that we can turn on um, so that we can turn on help um, when it's needed. Next, I'd like to turn to stimulus payments or economic impact payments. Overall, the IRS has done a good job of distributing more than 150 million payments, totaling $258 billion as of May 22nd. So those numbers are now a bit outdated. Not surprisingly, there have been missteps and policymakers can still mitigate one of them. And I'll focus on that now. Federal benefit recipients, like those receiving Social Security, but also receiving SSI or railroad retirement benefits and certain veterans benefits, those federal benefit recipients who did not file a tax return in 2018 or 2019 received automatic stimulus payments for themselves because IRS, after admittedly quite a bit of prodding, decided it could determine who was eligible among those federal beneficiaries and issue payments on their behalf but many social security and other benefit recipients are not getting the $500 payment they are owed for children in their homes. That's because IRS required social security recipients and the others to file an online form for those payments and set incredibly short deadlines with very little notice to do so. Many got just two days notice of a deadline. For those who couldn't meet the deadline, the IRS now says they must file a full tax return in 2020, which they would file in early 2021, to receive the remaining $500 per dependent child. 
We estimate that roughly 1 million children could miss out on the $500 payment if the benefit recipient wasn't able to file the online form. We believe that the IRS has the legal authority it needs to reopen the online form and then provide supplemental payments to those who are owed them. Unemployment benefits. Uh, turning to the unemployment benefit expansions in the CARES Act, CARES established the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance or PUA program to expand eligibility for, un to, to expand eligibility for unemployment benefits. It raised benefit levels and it increased the number of weeks workers could receive jobless benefits. In the week ending May 9th, these expansions provided critical relief to nearly 31 million jobless workers. The policy question now is whether these benefits or versions of them will continue as long as unemployment remains high. But there are implementation issues as well. As you heard, states received an avalanche of applications and there were delays in processing them. States needed time to program their systems to adjust benefit levels for the new increase in uh, benefit levels provided by the federal government. And setting up the PUA program presented real challenges. As of the week, of, as of the week ending May 9th, just 33 states were actually issuing, issuing PUA benefits, though other states had begun processing uh, applications. With the PUA program delayed, some workers who lost their jobs in March have been without unemployment benefits ever since, as multiple rent, car, and utility payments have come due. The challenges were really rooted in two underlying causes. First, state unemployment systems are outdated and underfunded, making it hard to implement changes quickly, particularly during a crisis. Second, our regular unemployment program is simply outdated. This means that when a sharp downturn occurs, we often institute policy changes at precisely the point that it is hard for states to implement them. The delays and other implementation problems are deeply troubling. I want to be clear about that. And they likely have had disparate impacts on workers of color and immigrants who are more likely to have had low paid jobs before the crisis and therefore low savings heading into the crisis to rely on. We need to fix the problems in the near term, and we need to build a far more robust unemployment system for the long term. But we also need to acknowledge that 31 million people in early May got significant help because of the expansions in the CARES Act. And almost 8 million of those individuals would have gone without jobless benefits entirely in the absence of the creation of the new PUA program. The last area I want to talk about uh, relates to immigrants and their families. Immigrants have been hard hit by the health and economic crises. Unfortunately, immigrants and their family members also face special challenges to receiving help. In some cases, immigrants, including both immigrants who are undocumented and those in the country with a documented status, are ineligible for certain assistance. In other cases, they and their family members, who are often U.S. citizens, are eligible for help through programs like SNAP and Medicaid, but they forgo assistance because they're afraid that receiving it will hurt them in future immigration proceedings, potentially forcing their families apart. Their long-standing fear has grown substantially worse in recent years. The administration's public charge regulation makes receipt of a broad set of benefits a negative factor for people applying for an immigration status. The rule has engendered fear well beyond those who would likely be directly affected. Federal agencies should help ensure that immigrants and family members access critical supports during the pandemic and economic crisis. The administration, for example, could change its public charge policy or postpone its implementation. Absent a policy change, it could still mount an aggressive outreach campaign to explain why many immigrants have nothing to fear from the public charge rule, to explain the importance of getting health care and testing during the public health emergency, and to explain the current public charge exceptions for COVID-19 testing and treatment. But the reality is that the administration's rhetoric and policies related to immigrants over the last several years 
now hinder the nation's relief and recovery goals and threaten the health and well being of millions of people. Policy actions and rhetoric have consequences, and I urge you to lay bare how the actions that have caused fear in immigrant communities has made it harder to effectively respond to the current crisis. Thank you again for this opportunity to present. Thank you, Ms. Parrott. Our next speaker is Maya McGinnis, president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Ms. McGinnis, a political independent, is an expert on federal budget, tax, and economic policy. For the past 20 years, she has worked closely with members of both parties and serves as a trusted resource on Capitol Hill. Ms. McGinnis testifies frequently before Congress and appears regularly as a commentator on television. Ms. McGinnis, we look forward to your comments. Thank you so much. And members of the committee, thank you for hosting this meeting today. People are enduring tremendous hardships through this. Clearly, this unprecedented moment calls for an unprecedented response Response, and oversight and accountability are critical components of that, particularly when we have had to get so much money out the door into the pockets of individuals, families, businesses, and the economy so quickly. So thank you to the committee for the important work you are doing to promote transparency and conduct oversight, which helps manage the trillions of dollars we are borrowing and lends credibility to the ongoing efforts. Our situation remains bleak with unemployment expected to remain around 15% for at least the next, next months, higher than any time since the Great Depression. GDP is expected to fall 11% this quarter and not return to its 2019 level until 2022 and not return to its previous path until 2030, a decade from now. And obviously there's great uncertainty around even those numbers. We basically had to put our economy on ice to fight the virus, and there are huge economic costs that go along with that. And of course, there are the 100,000 plus deaths and the many, many more who have been gravely ill. This is a painful moment for the nation and indeed for the world. We now have multiple objectives we must meet of fighting the pandemic, alleviating the hardships resulting from the economic shutdown, then aiding the economic recovery and returning to a place of healthy fiscal finances. When we entered this moment, the nation was already over indebted with the debt to GDP, the highest it had ever been other than just after World War II. What a reckless and unnecessary way to enter this emergency that was. This, however, is the exact right moment to borrow and borrow we have. So far, the legislative branch has committed $3.6 trillion, a good deal of which will be repaid and spent about 1.6 trillion of that. The Federal Reserve has committed $5.8 trillion and spent $2.4 trillion of that. The administration has also taken actions such as delaying tax filing deadlines and student loan interest payments. The Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget has created the COVID Money Tracker to help look at the record amount of money the government will be distributing through grants, contracts, loans, tax cuts, subsidies, and other measures. And through our interactive database, we will track how much is committed, what types of measures have been enacted, where the dollars are going, and to the extent that we can, how they are working, along with issuing a number of special reports on a variety of topics. Within each policy, we'll also track what states, industries, or sector of the economy receive assistance, and what, if anything, is expected in return for the money. The data will be as granular as possible. Compiling that information from dozens of different sources to make it usable for the public is a somewhat daunting task as you all well know. Some things that might be helpful to many, to many people and organizations that wanna help track the response would include urging the individual agencies to provide as much data as possible, going as granular wherever possible as they can, and using more streamlined reporting techniques across the agencies. Obviously, the faster the data is released, the more timely it is, the more helpful it will be. Data should be searchable and machine readable providing comprehensive information, not just about grants and contracts, but also loans and tax cuts will help paint the full picture. It's important and necessary that we track cases of waste, fraud, and abuse. And thank you for your work on that. Spending these dollars well is necessary for our fiscal health and confidence in the programs. At the same time, I hope we do not let these examples, of which there will certainly be many, 
not let them overshadow the many examples of successful measures, which will most certainly be the vast bulk of the response measures. And so far, the measures that we've undertaken in record time with broad bipartisan support have really been very impressive. And we should stop and appreciate how much has gotten done on that front. Being as nimble as possible to respond to public areas of interest as they arise, such as things like more detailed data on what's happening in the states or who has returned loans would be very desirable. And a final thought, moments like today that network government and experts and stakeholders and the public are particularly helpful when these issues are moving so quickly and there are so many differing opinions and interests. Expertise is not politics should guide our decision making and including a multitude of voices in these discussions is very helpful with that. Lastly, the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget naturally brings a fiscal lens to public policy issues. And as I mentioned, we entered this moment dangerously over indebted. Now, the right thing to do is add more debt and a lot more. But it is critical those funds be spent wisely and judiciously. And then finally, once we are through the pandemic and the recession, we as a nation will need to turn our attention to getting that debt under control so it doesn't impede the recovery, the economy, our national security, or the economic well being of workers and families across the country. Our debt is projected to exceed the size of the economy this year and set a new record for the nation as soon as next year. We cannot ignore this final step of fiscal prudence and stewardship. So, to close, in a moment where data transparency and accountability are so critical, I really want to thank this committee uh, for your important work and for hosting this hearing today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGinnis. Our final panelist is Jason Crume, president of the Bipartisan Policy, Policy Center. Over the last decade, the Bipartisan Policy Center has combined the best ideas from both parties to promote health, security, and opportunity for all Americans. Mr. Grumet regularly authors commentaries in national publications and is frequently called upon to testify before Congress and offer guidance to policymakers and business leaders. Mr. Grumet, the microphone is yours. Well, thank you, Vice Chair Martin and uh, members of the PRAC. At this moment of unprecedented tragedy and trauma, the imperative for substantive and civil engagement, like the session you are hosting today, is more important and more challenging than ever. And I truly do feel fortunate to be given even a 10 minute temporary membership among the dedicated, rigorous and courageous IG community. I am also mindful of the fact that I am the final speaker after what has been a very long and productive session. And so before summarizing just four points specific to the work of the body, I'd like to just offer a few introductory thoughts. The first is to acknowledge that Congress and the administration have taken bold and bipartisan action and directed unprecedented reserve and resource to support working families, businesses, health providers, and vulnerable communities. While we at the Bipartisan Policy Center are encouraged by our government's demonstration of competence under duress, we are also mindful that any response at this speed and in this scale will inevitably have flaws in design and in execution. The PRAC is essential to assessing these critical investments in real time so that our nation's leaders can openly confront implementation challenges and improve program efficiency and impact. Second, by guarding the integrity of the CARES Act and rigorously assessing its implementation, the PRAC can help the country rebound stronger than before. Emergency investments in paid family leave, in childcare, in SNAP benefits, and the ensuing debates over incentives to get the country back to work are experiments that we must learn from to shore up the financial strength and resiliency of American households and enable a more dynamic, resilient, and equitable economy. Finally, the PRAC can play a key role in building trust in our institutions. The compounding crises we are facing reveal a really profound contradiction between the competing need for government action in a way that is more compelling than I think at any time, certainly in my career, at a moment of such deep-seated mistrust in governing institutions. The unique ability of independent inspectors general and this committee to bring transparency to these investments is essential to build public trust. And your commitment to doing this work like you are today in a manner that is visible to the public is extremely meaningful. In the spirit of fiscal transparency, I think it is important to share with the committee that the Bipartisan Policy Center is a direct beneficiary of the CARES Act, having applied for and received a loan under the PPP. 
As designed, this loan has enabled us to forestall consideration of layoffs while desperately hoping for a V-shaped economic recovery. I'd like to now turn to some brief comments on the mission of the committee. As many of you know, the Bipartisan Policy Center has examined opportunities for improving government oversight with our task force on inspectors general and a task force on executive branch oversight, which published and released reports in 2018 and 2019. These projects inform some of my remarks over the next few moments. So first, the Bipartisan Policy Center recommends that the PRAC provide the American public with as much information as possible about its work, its reports, and its findings regarding the response to this pandemic and stimulus spending. Much can be learned from and emulated uh, from the Recovery and Transparency Board that has been mentioned earlier today under the 2009 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. The Recovery Board, which like the PRAC was made up of inspectors general, has been hailed for the access to information it provided and for the creation of recovery.gov, which was a one-stop shop for information about the status of ARRA spending and oversight. A similar dedicated effort is necessary here, and we are very impressed already with the progress being made on pandemicoversight.gov. One specific area to highlight is the access to agency reports and information. As you know, the CARES Act specifies numerous reports that have to be made public but it left unclear whether federal agency reports on the use of funds are required to be released to the general population. Given the rushed nature of the passage of the CARES Act, this was perhaps not intentional. Undoubtedly, each of your offices will have access to sensitive information not suitable for public disclosure, but we encourage you to make as much information public as is allowed using the disclosure requirements as the foundation, but not the ceiling for your public engagement. Second, the PRAC is essential in helping to improve the implementation of the CARES Act, not just catch bad actors. And this is a theme that I think you've heard throughout today's presentations. While much media coverage focuses on IGs engaging in solving scandals involving waste and fraud and abuse, the holy trilogy of uh, government oversight, the IG community's focus on strengthening the efficiency and the effectiveness of agency performance are equally, and at this moment, probably even more important. Your unique institutional knowledge built over extended periods of service combined with a truly street level understanding of agency operations and access to consistent information provides the PRAC with unique opportunity and obligation to identify these risks before they become public liabilities. We note that some but not all IG offices have released detailed plans for how they will conduct coronavirus spending and oversight. We believe that proactive efforts to promote consistent oversight will be essential to the successful deliberation and encourage that the PRAC assist all relevant IG offices in publicizing your oversight plans. Third, even though recent legislation included some significant additional funds for IG oversight, most IG offices do not have nearly adequate resources for this new workload. The CARES Act appropriated around $140 million to support these additional efforts at oversight, which is a lot of money. But you are required to now oversee the expenditure, as Maya pointed out, of well over $3 trillion in federal spending, and that's excluding the treasury programs. My wife is the lead agent when it comes to math and distant learning, but my brief recent calculations suggest that basically Congress has appropriated $1 of oversight resources for every $20,000 of federal spending. And if you kind of, as a ballpark, think of that in terms of, you know, FTEs, every full-time employee in an IG setting is basically responsible for overseeing three to $4 billion of the public trust. Now, obviously, that is not the way, thankfully, the IG system works. You are a community, not a series of independent actors. And it is important to recognize that we're going to require this community to kind of rise to the challenge to meet this incredible workload. We believe the PRAC should function as a clearinghouse for the IG community for assistance and best practices. Our commission in 2019 noted that IGs need better channels for sharing staff and taking advantage of shared resources to reduce costs. And while these efforts to expand capacity are not headline grabbing, they will result in tremendous return. We urge the PRAC to seize the opportunity to serve as this temporary clearinghouse and demonstrate the benefits that can be gained from a more permanent structure to support collaboration across the IG community. Finally, one of the greatest contributions the PRAC will provide is a comprehensive narrative and analysis of the government's stimulus efforts and implementation. Inspectors general across government will be conducting literally thousands of investigations, audits, and reviews over the next six to 12 months. 
While each of these reports will be valuable in its own respect, a collaborative effort from the PRAC is necessary to provide the larger context the public and policymakers will need in order to make informed judgments. Absent these informed and trusted judgments, anecdote will overwhelm substance and history will be written by those with the loudest voices regardless of evidence. The PRAC must provide substantive ballast to ensure that policymakers are not unduly swayed by the most extreme or the least representative examples of success or failure. Let me close by noting that inspectors general currently face an unprecedented level of scrutiny and politicization. I think I can speak uh, confidently on behalf of all of today's witnesses in expressing my admiration for the IGs and thousands of staff bring your jobs with vigor and integrity, despite what we all know is tremendous trauma and personal distraction. The IG community and the PRAC have a critical role to play in ensuring that our nation's limited and precious resources are being well spent, consistent with the requirements of the law and the urgent needs facing millions of American families. Bipartisan Policy Center is confident that the IG community and the PRAC will rise to meet this challenge. And like all the witnesses today, we are eager to help you in that endeavor. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Grumet. And thank you to all of our witnesses on this fourth panel. Michael, I'll turn the microphone back over to you for closing comments. Thank you, Paul. And let me echo my thanks to Ms. Parrott, uh, Ms. McGinnis, and Mr. Grummet for your uh, uh, words and thoughts and bringing together um, all of the various issues we touched on today um, and doing a great job in our fourth panel. Um, we in the IG community appreciate and understand the critical role that we are expected and have been called on to play in conducting oversight of the pandemic response effort. Um, through the PRAC, as well as through the audits, reviews, and investigations conducted by individual IGs, um, we're working tirelessly to meet that effort, uh, meet that challenge. Uh, but in order for us to be successful, we obviously need to hear from stakeholders like we heard today, other stakeholders out there who um, can provide much important insight into um, the areas that we will be overseeing uh, and to get your expertise and your views and your thoughts on um, how the pandemic response is being undertaken um, and how the federal government is meeting the challenges that it has been called upon to meet in these challenging times. So we greatly benefited from the uh, panels we heard from today. Thank you to the top witnesses for kicking off our effort and for your willingness to continue to um, support our efforts and work with us and provide us with our insights. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from other stakeholders as well as we go forward. Um, I want to thank the National Science Foundation for lending its technological resources, allowing us to move forward uh, today with this um, uh, panel and these, these panels and today's hearing. Um, and finally, I want to thank the members of the public that we all serve and who watch today's um, forum and has jo have joined us uh, to listen to the panelists tell us their views today. Please take the time, give us your feedback. We most importantly need to hear from you. Um, go to pandemic.oversight.gov, our website. You will see a feedback button there. Um, you can link to it and give us your feedback about today's program, about how the uh, pandemic response is going, report waste, fraud, and abuse, um, and most importantly, is to give us your thoughts. Um, as we close today's forum, we look forward to getting together again um, with you to get your views at future events like this. And appreciate your being with us, and thank you for joining us.